Welcome to the second half of chapter 5. In topic 2 we're going to talk all about chromosomes and how DNA is packed into them. So we have two main parts of this lecture. We're going to talk about chromosome structure and we're going to talk about how chromosomes are regulated. As always here are our topic objectives. Make sure you understand these and have them mastered by the exam and if there's any questions about them please let me know so we can discuss them in class and make sure that we have a good firm understanding of how they work. Alright, so let's get started. Every cell has the entire genome packed into it. So how does it do that? Because the human genome, if stretched out, would be over 2,000 miles wide, or 2,000 miles long, rather. So how is this packed into these tiny cells that we can't even see with the naked eye? And this is all because they're packed into chromosomes, and this is how we keep DNA condensed within the cell. And it is a very intricate packing process because it it has to be packed in a way that allows us to be able to not only replicate the genome when we go through cell division, but also read specific frames and find them and have them read throughout the cell's life so that if we need to make more protein X, we can find here's the gene for protein X, unwind that little bit and get what we need. So it's a very, very intricate process and we're not entirely sure exactly how it works. In fact, they're only highly condensed when it's in mitosis. That's when we see the chromosomes that we know and love. Other than that, they stay somewhat unwound a little bit within the nucleus of the cell. And we're going to look through a variety of these applications later or throughout this lecture. So the first thing I wanted to talk about before we get too far is how do we determine chromosomes? And there's two main types that we use of karyotyping. And both of these allow us to visualize chromosomes. The first one uses DNA hybridization, and this is the same process we talked about in the previous topic. We'll have specific sequences that we know are specific to chromosome number one. And we'll dye those, or dye that hybridization um, sequence with a specific color. And that allows us to color the chromosome. And as you can see here, so the chromosomes also are colored, and then they get rearranged so that the geneticist can tell whether or not there's the right number of chromosomes. It's really important that we do this because it allows us to easily tell if there um, if there's a problem with the fetus or even a mature adult we can look through their karyotype and see if they have two of every chromosome they're supposed to have or if they may have an extra or are missing something. Before we did this DNA hybridization there's chromosome banding and what happened is we'd use dyes that would attract areas that have a whole lot of C and G residues or a whole lot of A and T's and what that does is it created a banding, pro, uh, banding on these chromosomes and this banding was highly conserved between chromosomes so we could actually use this banding pattern to find out or to help tag the different chromosomes easily. And so both of these are just different ways of karyotyping that allow us to quickly assess the individual's chromosomes, if there's something wrong with the length, if there's too many, too few, any of the above. So chromosomes in the human body, hopefully most of this is a reminder, but we have 22 pairs, it means we're diploid, they come in pairs. We have A and we have, um, we have two number ones, we have two number twos, we have two number threes, etc. We have 22 of those smat of our normal chromosomes, and then we have two sex chromosomes. Women have two X's and men have an X and a Y. Red blood cells and sex cells vary on this though. Everybody else has all those. Red blood cells don't have any DNA, and then the sex cells actually have half of that. So they'll have 11, uh, or they'll have 22 chromosomes, not pairs of chromosomes, and one sex chromosome to be passed on. And this allows for the next offspring to only have 22 pairs because they get 22 from one parent, 22 from the other, plus one sex, of, sex chromosome of each to create 22 pairs plus two sex chromosomes. So it's really important to understand that. Some organisms, um, such as strawberries, are triploid, um, and they can have even more than that. Some of them have a lot of, of chromosomes. It just depends, and we'll talk about that later on in this uh, unit. But just be aware that not everything on this planet is diploid. Now, in general, you would assume that the more complex the organism, the more the greater their number of genes. But it's not always true. And more importantly, nothing ever runs in a linear sequence. Just because we have DNA that's in um, 
in a specific order doesn't mean that that's right in that order. In fact, things can jump around throughout the chromosome. So nothing is linear for our chromosomes. There isn't a specific, oh, chromosome number one is for all of the colorations on an individual, and chromosome number two is for height. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of movement around there. It has a lot to do with junk DNA. And we'll talk about how that works. And we also know that there are multifactorial diseases that incorporate many different segments of genes on many different chromosomes. So it's important to recognize that. And so while the general rule of thumb is that, yeah, the more complex an organism, the greater the number of genes, it's not always true. Because yes, while the human has 200 times more, gen uh, the genome is 200 times longer than yeast, we're still 30 times smaller than some plants. And the, our genome is 60 times smaller than amoebas. So it's important to understand that that's um, not always true. And just because there's more complex, um, that their genome is bigger doesn't mean that there's any big difference or that they're more complex of an organism. And as I said, most of this comes from junk DNA and we'll talk about how that all works later on in this unit. The same thing goes for chromosome arrangement. Chromosome arrangement is um, can vary even within similar species such as the muntjac that you can see here. The Chinese muntjac and the Indian muntjac are pretty closely related as you can tell from even just their picture. But look at their chromosomal makeup. The Chinese muntjac has a whole bunch of really small chromosomes where the muntjac only has a few. And this is just the way that their chromosomes are arranged and they've been selected this way for different evolutionary processes. And that's why we have 22 pairs uh, plus the sex chromosomes. It's just that that has been the process that seems to work best for our type of cell. And so it just depends. So just don't assume that everything always has the same number of chromosomes just because they're similar um, organisms or even close to the same number of chromosomes. So let's talk a little bit about the life cycle of chromosomes. As I mentioned, most of the time the chromosomes are fairly condensed within the cell, but not super condensed, not highly condensed to the point where we can see them under the light microscope. Almost all cells in the body are continually going through mitosis, which means that they're either in interphase or any part of emphase or back in interphase. And so that means that they, need, they will condense and relax a lot throughout the cell cycle. The only cells that aren't cycling are G0, but don't worry about them for now. Um, just be aware that there's this constant uh, um, opening and closing and replication and reading of the DNA. And so chromosomes are constantly being manipulated within the cell. As I mentioned, most cells are in interphase at any given moment. That's the longest phase. In um, interphase, there's a specific subphase called S phase, and this is where the chromosomes are being replicated. When they're not in S phase, the chromosomes are somewhat still re are still relaxed, but they're still kind of kept in different areas. And you can see through this coloration of the nucleus that there are specific areas where you can still find the chromosomes. And this is, helps the cell figure out where it needs to go real quick. Back to that example of we need more protein X. Well, protein X's gene is on chromosome 9. Um, the nucleus needs to know easily where the, the mechanism needs to know easily where chromosome 9 can be located so that it can go find protein X's genes to read. And so it's important that they are somewhat localized within the nucleus still, even though they're mostly just kept really um, loosely uh, coiled. So let's talk a little bit about chromosome structure. All chromosomes have to have some very specific areas. They all have to have a telomere. The telomere are these long ends of DNA that help make sure that the DNA is being fully replicated and that we aren't losing of the sequences. And we'll talk about telomeres um, in a few chapters from now, but don't worry about it too much for now. They also have to contain replication origins. Now, with us, we have more than one, but with like the circular DNA of E. coli, there's only one replication origin. They also have a centromere, and this is where the mitotic spindles will attach, and it's usually somewhere around the middle of the chromosome so that division can happen. So those are the three main parts of the chromosome. It's important to understand that those are all necessary for these chromosomes to be functioning properly. Any deviation in these, we can't do cell division, we can't read the cell, and etc. So now let's talk about how chromosomes are packed. And they are, as I said, they're always at some level of packing. They're tightly packed only in mitosis. That's when you can see the picture of them in the light microscope or anything else. So make sure you're aware of that, that the, they're always in some other loose, loose, looser state in, in the meantime. And we're going to walk through each of these different phases here on the next couple slides. 
But the first thing we need to talk about are chromatin proteins. So chromatin is a protein and the DNA together. That's what forms chromatin. And you can see here that there are histones and non-histones. Those are the two main proteins of chromatins. Now it's important to know that um, non-histones, we're not going to talk too much about in this class, but I want you to be aware that not every protein in chromatin is a histone. Now the histones come in four different types. We have H1, H2, and 2 has A and 2 has B, H3 and H4. And these are all involved in the, in the formation of chromatin. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But each of these histones have a little tail that helps them interact with the other histones. And you can see that coming off here on the graphic on this slide with the green, um, you can see the H3 tail, for example. But the other ones all have them too. And what happens is we can see the first level of chromosome packaging. And you'll hear people describe it as beads on the string. So the nucleosome, which is the, um, the histone, plus about 200 nucleotide pairs of DNA. And that's a little bit of what's wrapped around the histone plus a little bit on the sides. And that creates this uh, strand of pearls or beads on a chain or whatever you want to see. And you can see a picture of that here below. And so that allows us to see that. And these histones, these big circular histones, are eight protein subunits together. And you can see how they're broken down. Is we have two H2As, two H2Bs, two H3s, and two H4s. And this helps take DNA to approximately one third of its original length. So this is a nice first level of packaging. We then move into what's known as the 30 nanometer fiber. And this is where H1 comes into play. H1 helps package these nucleosomes into a tighter uh, fiber known as the 30 nanometer fiber. And you can just see how that's packing down just a little bit more. After this, we go into the 300 nanometer fiber, the 700 nanometer fiber, and then eventually the entire mitotic chromosome. We aren't sure exactly how we get from the 30 nanometer to the mitotic chromosome yet, but we're still working on all that. But it's really important to understand that when it's condensed, it's 10,000 fold shorter than what it was at its extended length. So it's really important to understand that this is a very concise packaging process. And these chromosomes need to be able to be opened and closed as they need to be read or tightly condensed for mitosis so that nothing gets broken or caught on something. Now there's a certain type of DNA that never gets uncoiled. It stays tightly condensed, it's never going to be read, and these genes are never expressed. And they're typically near the center or the end of the chromosomes, and these are just these regions that are just like that. And they can cause either phenotypic changes or there's stuff that um, we haven't seen expressed in the human population or in a specific population for very forever. And one example of this that we can see though is a bar body. And as I mentioned earlier, women have two X chromosomes, or females rather, have two X chromosomes, especially female mammals. And the second X chromosome is not expressed in all cells. So some cells will express, you know, X number one, some cells will express X number two. The second one is always condensed. So either if we're expressing X2 in cell A, in cell A we're going to um, have the X1 become heterochromatin, which is known as a bar body. And in cats, for example, hair color is on the X chromosome. So when a certain cell is expressing chromosome number two, the fur may be orange. If it's expressing chromosome number one, the fur may be black. And that allows us to see or see what the calico cats are. And that's why calico cats are almost always female. And if you have a male calico cat, that's they have two X chromosomes. So it's actually a, a problem in how many chromosomes they have if they're like that. So you can see how a heterochromatin works. Now, as I keep telling you, is it's more than just condens con condensation for replication that we need to worry about. Chromosomes need to be restructured and read and regulated all the time. And there's two processes that allow DNA to be read for cellular reg regulation. We have the chromatin remodeling complex, which, is our, which are ATP enzymes. So they have to use ATP to help open up the chromosomes to be read and then close them back down. And then we also have covalent modifications. And these are tags that are put on the outside of the genes that help determine if it should be silenced, should be expressed, or should be upregulated and expressing even more. If these tags get modified too much, that's when we can see too much um, 
protein or too much cell division, such as cancer, um, can arise from this or for missing them. That's where we can see some other changes. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more on our next slide because these patterns can be inherited. And this is where we started talking about epigenetics. And if you aren't familiar with epigenetics, I would refer you to the um, video I've put on Blackboard. It's a really interesting video about how epigenetics happens. But there's covalent modification tags through methylation and there's simulation and a few others that is inherited from parent to offspring. And these can change the way that genes work. And this can change whether or not they're red and whether or not they are. And they're also caused by environment as well. So we know that we can inherit some covalent modification patterns and we can also generate some throughout our lifetime. This is why um, identical twins, for instance, can be, um, can one can have cancer, one cannot. And that's actually the focus of that video I talked about. Um, as you can see from the cats here on this picture, you'd think these cats have no relation to each other. But actually the kitten is an exact clone of Rainbow, the cat you see on the right side. So the clone's name is Copycat. And that's different, their coats are different because of what I talked about with bar bodies and through the epigenetic variance between the two, that's why CC looks nothing like Rainbow as far as the coat goes, even though their genomes are identical. So I really encourage you to explore that a little bit more. We're not going to talk too much about epigenetics in this class, but it's a really intriguing concept. Anyways, this is the end of topic two for chapter five. Please let me know if you have any questions about this material and we will talk some more in class about it.